Sonological Mapping of Endometriosis. Why is it important for us to know exactly where the endometriotic deposits are? So let's first understand what endometriosis is. Endometriosis is basically the presence of endometrial tissue, which is functional and is present in a location which is not, not, not normally expected from it, that is in an extra uterine location. It can be seen in any peritoneal surface and even distant places like lung and the central nervous system. So what really happens? It basically causes, because it's a functional tissue, it causes bleeding, cyclical bleeding, which incites an inflammatory process, which further leads to fibrosis and adhesions. So all the complications that we will come across are secondary to these changes. So the normal presentations that we can see radiologically are the ovarian endometriomas, the superficial peritoneal implants, and the deep infiltrating endometriosis. This is how it normally presents. Ovarian endometriomas are something that we routinely pick up. All the people who are used to seeing doing ultrasound and um, because endometriosis is such a common Pathology seen these days, encountered these days, ovarian endometriomas we encounter very often. Superficial peritoneal implants are the ones which are very small, less than 5 millimeters, and are very difficult to pick. Deep infiltrating endometriosis are underreported ultrasound wise. It's most often reported by people on MRI, but they are deposits which are more than 5 millimeters and can actually be beautifully picked up on um, an ultrasound scan. And this can be done really well by a transvaginal scan. And today's talk is primarily going to be put uh, pay attention on how we can be doing that. So it is very important to have an accurate imaging because it will help the surgeons in planning, especially with adhesions in place. It is very difficult for the surgeons to be navigating their way through the abdomen. And we being able to tell them where these implants lie helps in uh, for them to plan their uh, technique and plan their approach. So it is very important that we go in a very structured manner. For that, the first and the foremost important thing is we have to compartmentalize the pelvis into three compartments. That is the anterior compartment, which is comprising of anything that is anterior to the uterus. So there is the distal end of the ureters, the bladders, the vesico-uterine pouch, and the vesico-vaginal pouch. Then we have the uterine or the central compartment, which is containing the uterine bodies, the fallopian tubes, the lig uterine ligaments, and also the ovaries. Then we have the posterior compartment, which is actually the uterosacral ligaments, which is a very important structure here. Then we have anything that is posterior and anterior to the rectum. So we have the anterior rectal wall. We have the uterosacral ligaments. Then you have the rectal vaginal sept uh, septum. And you also have the superior part of the rectum, that is the sigmoid colon. So this is the same anatomy, but here there are certain important structures that we need to know. The junction of the uterus and the fund uh, and the cervix is the torus uterinus, which is an important landmark for us. Then we have this retrocervical space. There is a predilection for the endometriotic deposits, especially the deep endometriotic deposits, to be present in the um, torus uterinus in the retrocervical region, and this is the rectovaginal septum. There is a predilection for the deposits to be there in this region. And also, this is the vesico-uterine fold or the pouch. So it's very important to know these terms because these would be important for us to be mapping our uh, deposits. So now coming compartment-wise for the approach, we have the bladder, which has the different areas. You have the urethra, then you have the trigone, where the the uh, ureters will come join the bladder base, the dome, and the extra abdominal or the extra peritoneal part. So uh, you will be able to see all universally when we look at the endometriotic deposits, most often in the anterior and the posterior compartments, and even in the middle compartment, the deposits are the deep endometriotic deposits are what we pick up, and they are universally seen as either hypoechoic irregular areas or this area of smudged heterogeneity that we are able to pick up. And that is how it's going to appear in all the places. And the other pointers that could be seen as uh, favoring towards the endometriotic deposits are the addition or the fibrosis that it's causing and the changes that this fibrosis will cause to the adjacent structures. So um, we will look at the appearance in the bladder. 
Here you can see that there is a structure that is growing within the bladder. It is uh, a deposit which is growing from the bladder wall intraluminally, and you're seeing cystic spaces. It's very important that if you're seeing a endometriotic deposit which is touching the bladder wall, it should not be labeled as a, a bladder endometriosis because a bladder endometriosis is when it has invaded the muscular wall or you're seeing it intraluminally. And this is the kind of deposit that we are talking about. You're seeing an intraluminal deposit. You're seeing certain cystic spaces, which are also, and there is, of course, a supportive clinical evidence. This patient would possibly give you a history of cyclical hematuria and painful hematuria. So uh, then we should also be commenting of whether it is extending into the vesico-uterine pouch, but that's the next uh, step. You can also be looking at the ureters. Uh, actually, in a normal patient itself, you will be able to pick the ureters. The distal end of the ureter can be picked up. Here you can see the base of the bladder is seen. And then as you come towards the trigone, sorry, now you're seeing the trigone and you can see the ureter coming off. And this is another example where you're seeing there's an endometriotic cyst and it is causing compression of the distal ureter and there's proximal dilatation of the ureter. So it is uh, not because if you look at the side of the size of the endometriosis, the endometrium, endometrioma is actually not big enough to cause compression, but the adjacent fibrosis is what is causing compression of the ureter. So next we have the vesico-uterine pouch that is a space between the bladder and the uh, uterus. So that is another important area that we should be looking out for. Here you can see this is the uterus. You can see this deposit here. This is the compressed or the collapsed bladder. You can see this deposit in this region. Then coming to the middle compartment, you will look at the uterus and uterus most often will follow the MUSA guidelines for adenomyosis. That's what we primarily get the features in the uterus. Here you can see a classical case of adenomyosis where you have a globular uterus. You are seeing that there is diffuse heterogeneous myometrial echoes. There is thickening of the uh, myometrium. And you're seeing this vention blind uh, like shadowing that you're seeing and a hyperechoic reflections that you're seeing. This is the classical appearance of adenomyosis. You are also not able to appreciate the endomyometrial junction well. It is very hazy. But in addition to that, you can also get myometrial cysts. Or sometimes you might get these ecogenic deposits in the myometrium, which are ectopic endometrial tissues, which you're seeing as these ecogenic deposits. So these are the appearances of different appearances of the adenomyosis. In addition to that, in, uh, in relation to endometriosis, what else can you be looking at uterus? Here you can see the uterus is actually antiverted, but you can also see that it is retroflexed because there is uh, acute um, flexion of the fundus of the uterus, which is being flexed posteriorly. And you can see that there is possibly some inhomogeneous area that you're seeing at the fundus of the uterus, which is causing a fibrotic pulling of the uterus towards the posterior aspect and is causing this retroflexion. This is classically called as the, uh, the question mark sign. This is called as a question mark sign. And even if you don't see the deposits, it ideally you should look for the deposits there. You would be able to see the deposits. If you're not able to appreciate the deposits also, it might be a sign that it's not actually DE, which is the deep in infiltrating endometriosis. Rather, it could be that there are deposits of superficial endometriosis also in this location. Now coming to ovary, ovarian uh, endometriosis or the endometriomas are something which we often encounter and something which we are very used to. We see this classical unilocular or multilocular cystic areas which have this ground glossing uh, contents which are very homogeneous and dense and uniform. And you might also see uh, areas of echogenic deposits along the walls which are also suggestive of clots which are there on the periphery. This is the classical ovarian endometrioma. But what should we do after this? This can cause adhesions again because there would be, it would be associated with other endometriotic deposits. So what do we do next? Next, we need to assess the mobility of the, uh, endo, the endometrioma. Here you can see that we are assessing. I would be talking about this uh, in the later part of the talk. So I'm not elaborating it here right now. So then coming to the tubes. In the normal circumstances, we do not see the tubes. But if you see an endometriotic tube, then it is going to look exactly like a hematosalpins or a pyosalpins, and there's no way to differentiate it. It technically is a hematosalpins. So you will see this convoluted structure, which is having incomplete septations, and you will have the 
contents within. You have contents, you have incomplete septations and the cogwheel appearance, which is classical for the hydrosalpings, but you're having thick walls and you're having contents, ground glass contents with it, which cannot be differentiated from biosalpings. So again, you need to rely on the clinical history in these backgrounds. So hematosalpings and um, endometriotic uh, uh, involvement of the tubes or the hematosalpings and the biosalpings are mimickers of each other. Moving on further, we are going to the posterior compartment. And this is the main area where there is a predilection for the deep invasive endometriosis to go and deposit. And for this, we will follow primarily the IDEA guidelines, which are very good. Um, it's a must read, actually. You have very good images and pictographical representations of what we should be looking at and what is the uh, pattern of recognition of these deposits. So we have already said that it is involvement of the posterior vaginal fornix, the rectal vaginal septum, the uterosacral ligaments, the anterior rectum, anterior rectus sigmoid junction and the sigmoid codon. So uh, when do we say uterosacral ligaments, these uterosacral ligaments are not normally seen, but you can roughly estimate the location. It is seen, it is structures which are coming from the lateral aspect and coming and joining at the uh, level of the posterior aspect of the uterus. And this is roughly where you go to see this hypoechoic uh, areas on the lateral view. Also, you can see them. But it is most often appreciated. This is because these are marked images that have ad adapted from the articles. But you most often will be able to appreciate it when you get the deposits there. And this is a site of predilection. So we have to look out for it. And we will oftentimes find deposits along the uterosacral ligaments. So in this particular case, you can see that there is an endometrioma. And when you trace it further, you will see that there is the deposits along the uterosacral ligament. There's a thickening of the uterosacral ligament. So this is uh, an ovarian endometrioma with adherence to the uterus. And then this is the deposit along the uterosacral ligament. So coming to the rectovaginal septum. This is one of the major reasons where we as radiologists have a role to play because rectovaginal septum is a blind spot when they come uh, for a laparoscopic surgeon because it is present extraperitoneally. You can see it in this diagram. It is an area which is present extraperitoneally. And how do we identify this? It is the level of the uh, part that is anterior or between the vagina and the rectum, but it is also the part which is seen below the posterior fornix. So here you can see this is the posterior fornix, vaginal fornix, and what you're seeing below that is the rectovaginal septum, and this is the end of the peritoneal, peritoneal cavity, and so this is a blind spot. So a rectovaginal septum is something that is uh, that can be easily missed. So there, again, our importance lies in us telling that there is a deposit in this region. So how can you get the deposit? You can get a deposit from the posterior vaginal wall, which is infiltrating into the, um, uh, it is infiltrating into the uh, rectovaginal septum, or you can that you can see here also. And for appreciating the vaginal wall better, we should be able to, um, we can instill jelly or saline into the vaginal cavity and we can distend the um, vaginal cavity and be able to appreciate the vaginal wall better. The other way you can see is when there's a deposit in the rectum and it is protruding into the rectovaginal septum like you're seeing it here. Here you can see the deposit which is extending into the rectovaginal septum. Or you can see a through and through vaginal wall to the rectum a deposit which is involving the rectovaginal septum also. So uh, it is uh, here you can see that there is a deposit which is extending from it is extending from the bowel wall. Uh, there you can see it is extending from the bowel wall. This is the deposit in the bowel wall. And you can see it extend along the rectovaginal septum and into the vagina. So Coming to the vagina, we already said that you can see it better when it is in the vaginal wall. You can appreciate it better when you are having a jelly or saline within the vaginal cavity. You might see it as a focal thickening or as a proper hypoechoic deposit within the vaginal wall. So bowel is, again, something that you can appreciate on a transvaginal scan beautifully. For this, you need to put your transvaginal probe into the posterior fornix. And when you put it in the posterior fornix, you get a better visualization of the structures that align posterior to the uh, cervix. 
So here we can see that this is a normal USG where you can appreciate the normal bubble wall. You can actually see the layers of the bubble also. It is appreciated beautifully. This is for comparison. And this is the involvement. This is a case where you have the uh, bubble wall and you're seeing there is a deposit in the rectum. It is extending up to the rectovaginal septum and up to the vagina. So when you get involvement of bubble, how is it that we are going to describe further? So when you're seeing an involvement of the bubble, we are going to say the location is based on uh, these terminologies that have been kind of, uh, suggested by the IDEA guidelines. So you have the lower anterior rectal. So you have the anterior rectal, which has the lower part and the upper part. And how do we determine which is the lower and the upper? That is determined by the attachment site of the uterosacral ligaments, which is at the level of the, uh, which you can, or at this, you can see at this level. So you're getting the rectovaginal septum here. What is you're seeing below that? This is the lower anterior rectal area. And anything that is above the level of the, um, Attachment of the uterosacral ligaments becomes the level of the upper anterior rectal. What you're seeing at the level of the junction of the um, at the level of the uterine fundus, which is seen here, you, that part becomes the level of the rectosigmoid junction. And whatever you're seeing above the level of the fundus becomes the anterior sigmoid or the sigmoid, the anterior part of the sigmoid. So you have the level of the uterosacral ligaments. Below that is the lower anterior rectal. Above the um, uterosacral ligaments becomes the above superior or the uh, upper anterior rectal. At the level of the uterine fundus, you have the rectosigmoid junction. Above the uterine fundus, you have the sigmoid. So now how do we describe the bubble wall thickening? There are different terminologies. You can have it seen as a focal thickening as can be seen here. You can also see it like a focal thickening with an extended thickening, uh, which gives a comet tail-like appearance. Or you can have this kind of an appearance where you have this thickening, which is having, uh, because of it is its fibrosis, it's causing the speculated ends, which gives an Indian headdress or a moose antlers uh, appearance. Otherwise, you can have the same Indian headdress appearance, but it is growing into a cavity. When it grows into the cavity, it is causing narrowing of the lumen. But what happens when it is sitting outside and it is causing fibrosis, it is going to start pulling the structures. So when it is pulling the structures, it is called as the pulling sleeve sign. So any endometriotic deposits, what do we do further with that? We need to measure it. And how do we measure it? There are three dimensions we need to take of every single endometriotic deposit. And once we have measured it in three different orthogonal planes, there are certain specific things that we need to mention. If you see a deposit in the ureter, you need to mention the distance of the deposit from the uh, vesico-uterine junction, vesico-uretric junction. If you see a deposit in the bowel, then you have to say if it's causing any compression of the lumen. If yes, how much luminal compromise is there? You need to give a measurement of this deposit from the anal verge. So you have to be, give, be able to give this distance. Further from this, you can get multicentric and multifocal deposits. If you get multicentric deposits, you need to measure the deposits individually, but if you see multifocal deposits, like in this case, you need to take the cephalochordal dimension and the caudal end of the deposit is what you're going to measure to the anal virgency. Now, the, uh, in addition to the uh, direct presence of the endometriotic deposits, what is it in addition to that we are looking? We are looking for uterine sliding sign, which is a very important feature. For this, you place your probe in the posterior fornix and you're putting pressure on the cervix because you want to see whether the anterior rectal wall is going to slide over the uterus. So this should be the routine movement. You should be able to put pressure and the uterus will move, but uterus and anterior rectum will move in opposite direction, sliding over each other. So that is the kind of movement. This is a normal uterus, which is sliding against the rectal wall. But here you can see that the pressure is causing a movement, but that movement is not reflective of the separate, that is not reflecting separate changes or separate movement between the uterus and rectum. They are moving as a single unit. It is because of the pressure. It's not sliding over each other. So that is basically a frozen pelvis. It's all moving in unison. This is a normal uterus. And this is a uterus which is frozen and moving 
in unison as a single unit because it is not moving against each other it's moving together because of the pressure and this is how it would appear in a retroverted uterus here you can see again you can see this kind of a movement where there's pressure which is moving structures but it's not really moving against each other so if you see this kind of uh, a finding you have to mention in any of your reports you have to mention if the uterine sliding is present or not if the sliding is present you're going to say that the pelvis or the pod is not obliterated but if you do not see the uterine sliding you have to mention that sliding sign is negative or the pod is obliterated it is very important to say it's not obliterated or to say that it is obliterated so again a revision quick uh, recap of things in anterior compartment you have to look for the vesicouterine pouch you can get it in the bladder you can get it in the ureter if you get it in the ureter you uh, measure the distance from the area of attachment further in the posterior compartment you can see it in the rectovaginal septum and like mentioned you have to mention whether it is only in the septum or it is involving the vaginal or the rectal wall then you have to say which level of the bowel is involved then we have to mention whether there is involvement of the uterosacral ligaments then how do we measure it and the distance from the anal ridge now coming to the superficial endometriosis it is extremely difficult to appreciate superficial endometriosis but in this scenario what we have to understand is that fluid is a very good friend for us because if there is fluid there is chances that we might pick it up otherwise it is extremely difficult or rather it's near to impossible to pick up superficial endometriosis so how do we see it you can see it as superficial hypoechoic areas small hypoechoic projections some cystic areas just some pockets of fluid in the peritoneal layer or some filmy adhesions or flecks of uh, tissue that you can see. Uh, I mentioned that the fluid is a very good friend or a medium where you can see the superficial endometriosis because of which there is a system known as a podography where they instill saline infusion, in, they do saline infusion into the POD. So that gives you a very good uh, dimension or a, uh, a medium through which you can see the superficial endometriotic deposits. So here you can see this fleck which is moving on pressure, that is a deposit of superficial endometriosis. And this is in similar manner, is a superficial endometriotic deposit. Next, we have certain soft markers. Like I mentioned, we are talking about uterine sliding. In the same way, there are two soft markers. One is ovarian mobility and site-specific tenderness. These two things are uh, helping us even if we don't see any deposits, these are two uh, findings which will help us such as that there might be some superficial endometriotic deposits and um, especially the pelvic side wall deposits. So one of the important factors are uh, ovarian mobility and this case which I had shown earlier and I had not elaborated on, I will show it again because this demonstrates the mobility very well. Here you can see a PCOT morphology, a PCO morphology ovary, which is actually moving against the uterus when you're moving it. You can see it move against the uterus. But here you can see that this one is moving in pressure, but like in the uterine sliding sign, it is moving in unison with the uterus. It's not moving against it because it is adherent at this position. So even if you had not seen this kind of condition here, if you had seen an ovary which was sitting here and which was moving in this kind of a fashion, you should be able to say that there possibly is a um, superficial endometriotic deposit there even if you cannot demonstrate a deep endometriotic deposit because that is a sign that there is some adhesion there. So in this particular case is just an example. This is a case where you're seeing there is involvement of the ovaries. You're seeing there is uh, extension up to the posterior surface that is a torus. This is also the case I'd shown earlier. You can see the underlying uterus is involved. It is having adenomatic features. You are seeing a deposit here, which is going into the recto vesico uterine junction. Then you have the, uh, yeah. So you are having, you are seeing here, you are seeing that when you are putting pressure, there is no mobility that is demonstrated. That is, the POD is obliterated. And in the same case, you can see that there are multiple uh, deposits that are seen in the bubble wall. So these are the bubble wall deposits that you are seeing. So how would you report this case? If this, these are the findings in this patient, how are you going to report this case? So when you're going to give issue the report of this patient, you have to mention that there is, I'm not giving you the descriptors here, 
So you have to talk about the patient having adenomyosis. You have to say that there is endometriosis or endometriotic deposit in the vesicouterine pouch. And you have to mention the dimensions and there is additions. You have to talk about the presence of the endometrioma and the measurement of the endometrioma. You're going to talk about the presence of the plaque, endometriotic plaque that you're seeing at the level of the torus uterinus. And again, there is addition with the ovary. Then you're seeing multifocal involvement of the bubble lesions and how much is the measurement and how far it is to the anal verge. And you have to say that it's not causing any bubble narrowing. And because the sliding side was negative, the POD is obliterated. So this is how we have to issue our reports. This is a beautiful uh, representation I had got from one of the articles, which is actually giving a very beautiful representation of how you can ac accurately map the presence of the endometriosis, and which can be very useful if you are able to utilize this. It's a very uh, diagrammatically representative reporting system if this can be utilized. If you see this kind of a patient, a 22-year-old primary gravita who is uh, known to be a patient who had endometriosis and you see this uh, patient have this kind of an appearance, what would be your concerns? Naturally, we will be concerned about this patient having this solid area, which is vascular. So this is going to be favoring malignancy. And so you're going to expect uh, this patient needs to be evaluated or this patient needs to undergo a surgery. But for some reason, if this patient is put on follow-up and you find this kind of an appearance postpartum, at say this was a three weeks postpartum. So what does it mean? This is a sign that this is basically, there is an entity known as decidualization of endometrioma. So because we said it is basically a functional endometrial tissue, when the decidual, decidual changes occur, the similar changes can occur there. And then you get this kind of an appearance you might get this kind of an appearance where you have a very heterogeneous uh, area, a very um, solid looking area, lots of solid looking area or predominantly solid looking lesion. But if you do not have a clinical suspicion, if the patient is very stable, there's no clinical suspicion whatsoever. That patient could be put on a short term follow up through the pregnancy, you can walk her through. And after the delivery, you can see that this would shrink. So it's very important that we follow this patient's car carefully and work up this patient's only then make a decision of whether the patient needs to be uh, taken up for surgery or not. So what is the take-home message here? It's very important that we do a transvaginal scan because that shows it beautifully and it gives us, helps us attain even the small, uh, appreciate even the small deposits. So that should be the first line of investigation. It is very important that we tell uh, where the deposits are, the endometriomas would stand out for us. But predicting where the DIEs are present and whether the POD is obliterated or not is very important for the surgeon to be able to plan out their surgical approach. And they would be able to prime the patient prior to the surgery also and be able to tell them what possible complications the patient might undergo. So it is extremely uh, important for us to do it. And it is also important that these cases are going to require a lot of expertise. It depends on the, there would be a lot of intra-observer variability. So it requires a lot of experience. So make sure that when you see a case of endometriosis, work up the patient entirely. Look for all these specific places, look for all these specific findings, because a structured, when you do it in a structured manner, you will start looking at all these findings and you will get better and better at picking up these deposits. So these are some really must-read articles for endometriosis ultrasound. It's a very beautiful article, both of them, IDEA guidelines and also SIU guidelines. So thank you so much and keep practicing because the more you do it, you're going to pick it up more. Thank you so much. <laughs>